The Gospel of Luke tells us that after Jesus' death and resurrection, he met two disciples as they were walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus. We're seated here this afternoon at the foot of the old Roman road that wound its way from Jerusalem down the valley towards Emmaus. My colleague is Halver Running, a contributing member to the Jerusalem School of Synoptic Studies and a licensed guide here in Israel. Most visitors to Israel are aware of the fact that there are two or three traditional sites for almost every biblical event. For example, there are three shepherd's fields. There are two traditional locations for the crucifixion and the interment of Jesus. And there are approximately three locations for the biblical site of Emmaus. However, Jewish sources from the first century not only assist us in understanding the biblical text itself, but can also assist us in actually pinpointing many of these biblical sites. However, just exactly how can we know that where we are seated and the road and the valley down which we are looking is the actual road to Emmaus? Well, sometimes the Bible just is so very clear that there is no doubt like about where Jerusalem is located. But in this case, we're only given one fact, and that is a certain distance from Jerusalem that Emmaus is located. The methodology that's required here is to go and check other Jewish literature of the time of the New Testament. And thank God we've got such literature. Not only the Jewish literature of the New Testament written by Jews, but other literature prior to that time and around that time, following that time, that can throw light and can be a possible source of making an identification. Now I've got a copy here of one of the volumes of the Babylonian Talmud in an English translation, the Sonsino translation. And here in the Talmud there's a tractate that deals with the Festival of Tabernacles and it's talking about a place below Jerusalem that's called Moza. And here the Mishnah commentary on the Jewish law is asking about a certain ceremony of willow branches being put around the altar in Jerusalem and it says, how was this precept of the willow branch carried out? There was a place below Jerusalem called Moza, and they went down there and gathered thence young willow branches and then came and fixed them at the sides of the altar so that their tops bent over the altar. And the description goes on with the blowing of the ram's horn and the beating of the palm branches at this festival of tabernacles in the fall of the year. But here's this little reference to a place below Jerusalem called Moza. Now, Moza is a Hebrew word that means a spring of water, something where something comes forth, comes out, and often refers to a spring. And there's a footnote in the Gemara commentary on the Mishnah where it says it was taught this place was called Colonia. Well, Colonia is a Latin name. So we've got a place called Moza in Hebrew, which is also known by a Latin name, Colonia, and it still hasn't gotten us to our biblical name, Emmaus. But there's another Jewish source and this one is from the first century A.D. It's the description of the Jewish war against Rome by Josephus Flavius, or his Hebrew name, Yosef ben Matityahu. He was one of the rebel commanders, actually, at the beginning of the revolt, but he went over to the Roman side as he saw with what massive forces the Romans were coming. And he tells about the destruction of Jerusalem, and he tells about the destruction of the temple, and what Caesar did for some of the soldiers, some of the Roman soldiers, that he paid evidently not with cash, but with land. At this time, Caesar sent instructions to Bassus and Liberius Maximus, the procurator, to farm out, to lease out the Jewish territory. The Romans were just fed up with these Jewish rebels, and they didn't want any Jews anywhere in Jerusalem or around Jerusalem. 
And so this Jewish land is being farmed out. Now this procurator founded no city there because he was reserving the countryside as his private proprietor, property, except that he did assign 800 veterans discharged from the army a place for habitation called Emmaus, about 30 furlongs distant from Jerusalem. Well, now again, we've got a name and a certain distance from Jerusalem. And if we look across in this Loeb classical edition, where you've got English on one page and the Greek on the other page, on the other side over here, the name in Greek for Emmaus is Amaus. And that is almost identical to what we've got in the Greek New Testament manuscripts, Amaus, for the name of this place that Jesus was headed for with these two disciples. So when we see that a colony of Roman soldiers was settled at a place, Amaus, and we know that just on down the hairpins of this valley, there's a village which up until just a couple decades was called Colonia in Arabic, a variation of a Latin name, Colonia, where this colony of Roman veterans lived at a place called Emmaus. We can piece these things together, and we've got a site that fits beautifully into the Bible story. Not only the, the location, the distance, for example, the furlongs mentioned fits in exactly with Luke's account here where he says that Emmaus was approximately seven miles from Jerusalem, the distance being the same, but now we've got the, the Latin name Colonia, which was next to Emmaus, as is mentioned in the Jewish sources, so it all fits to such a degree that we can, according to your expert opinion, say for a certainty that this is the biblical road to Emmaus. That's right, and that's the thrill of realizing that let's put our New Testament texts into their proper Jewish context. And then as we search out that Jewish context, we can piece things together and have light thrown, in this case, on geography. You know, Roy, we've been talking about Jewish sources and how they help us to locate where a story took place. But what really impresses me, after all, is uh, what happens in this story. When I think that Jesus has to decide who he's going to appear to as the very first ones on resurrection morning. Now, a friend of mine said, why, if I were Jesus and I had to think over to whom I'm going to appear on resurrection morning, I'd go to Pontius Pilate, and when he's there sleeping in bed, I'd go and I'd tap him on the shoulder, and I'd watch his face as he woke up. And next, I'd go to that Jewish king, Herod Antipas, and I'd do the same thing to him. And I'd watch his face as he woke up, and would see me standing there, risen from the grave. You know, as you let your mind just start rolling with the fact that that was a decision Jesus really had to make, and the decision he made was to appear to two men who were sad because he was gone. And in Luke, it, we've been discussing, it's these two men walking down the road to Emmaus. Uh, what a Lord we have! Or in the other Gospels, it's Mary, the first one to whom he appears, mourning, sad, out of her love there in the garden. What a Lord, not somebody who's out to impress people, but one who appears to those who love him. Because of available Jewish sources which help us illuminate the history of this country, we've been able to uncover much of its past. Here on the road to Emmaus, we have one of those few places in all of Israel where we can say with absolute certainty, I walk today where Jesus walked.